For Krima Media's Policy, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Andre Odendal to discuss his book titled Dear Comrade President, Oliver Tambo and the Foundations of South Africa's Constitution. One would say that the history of the ruling African National Congress leaders has been well documented uh, over the years. What does yours aim to highlight and why Oliver Tambo? My two interests have been um, the history of the liberation struggle, but in particular, the early origins of constitutional politics amongst black South Africans. And that led to my books, Fukani Bantu, which was based on my master's and uh, the founders in 1912, Mm -hmm. which basically explain uh, from the 1860s to 1912, rather than starting at 1912. Mm -hmm. And in this book, uh, rather than starting in February, 1990, I go back to the mid eighties and look at what I've, think needs to be recognized as phase one of the constitution making process. It was based basically in Lusaka between 1985 from the time of the Kabwe conference to December 1989 with the acceptance by the United Nations and organized humanity really of the Arari Declaration, which was a document that Tamba oversaw and literally collapsed when he crossed the last T of it in 1989. And in those five years, there's a remarkable story because um, today we have um, all sorts of debates about the constitution and whether somehow or other it's the constitution's fault that we are in the situation we're in, this very depressing situation the unacceptable levels of non-delivery and socio-economic equality and so on. And the constitution becomes a a sort of easy target to beat, you know, for the populist forces, which are, in my opinion, mostly not progressive. I think it's very important to question the constitution, have a debate about it, and especially for young people to challenge it in terms of new ideas. The Black Lives Movement was very important. The new ways in which critical theory looks at different um, things differently, perhaps, to 30 years ago. So those are all important. But let us at least know what we're talking about How was the constitution drawn up? Who wrote the first words? Where did they happen? Who was the secretary of the constitution committee that drew up the constitutional guidelines? When were they adopted? People know nothing of these things. And the beauty of this um, research for me has been to sit since the Kabwe conference in 1985 and to look at the ANC constitutional committee's specific archive. I've deliberately gone to the archives rather than interviewed people and on that basis try to be um, in any way definitive because there's so much noise, there's so much division today that, you know, you, you need to to base it in something deeper, I think, although those are wonderful sources for history usually. So what I did was I got access to the ANC's constitutional, um, uh, legal and constitutional affairs department. Uh, They are at Fort Hare, Witz and Maibuya Center, which I helped start in the uh, 1990s. And um, also private papers by Jack Simons, before that terrible fire at UCT Library, the Asmal papers, um, uh, work from Professor James Gerwald's uh, papers, and also, of course, Albie Sachs has, got, has left his connection uh, at, at Maibuya. And it's been a, a, a real discovery for me how this process unfolded. And what I really say in the book is that the template for the Constitution was already laid by December 1989, weeks and and months before F.W. de Klerk unbanned 
the organizations and started a new period of legality and with which is usually identified with um, the constitution making process. I would say then that that is phase one from 85 to December 89 or February, April 1990. Phase two is of course the actual beginning of talks and negotiations from uh, 1991 in particular uh, up to April 1994. And phase three, uh, which was um, a demand of the ANC from the beginning, if one looks at the archive, that they would not draw up the constitution, but rather outline the constitutional guidelines, the values and principles that should, in their opinion, underlie a future constitution. And then after 1994, uh, from May thereafter, you had the Constitutional Assembly then sitting with elected representatives of South Africa's people for the first time, finalizing that constitution, which was signed into being uh, appropriately at Sharpeville in December 1996. So there... Um, when we talk about the Constitution and its merits today, I, I make the argument in the book that we should look at those three phases in great depth. And hopefully, dear Comrade President, um, gives us a start on phase one. What I went out to do, I tried to look, follow that one strand and see how it linked with other aspects of this multiple level struggle. I mean, before, besides the four pillars of mass mobilization, underground work, um, armed action, and international solidarity, there could be what one calls this fifth pillar that developed after Kabwe in 1985. I can then just briefly outline this process. So Kabwe was called as a council of war. The ANC was undergoing difficulties, the abuses in the camps in Angola uh, spread across the globe. Um, and one could see that uh, the officers had grown external missions from nine in the ninth, end of the 60s to, um, to well over 40 uh, by the um, 1980s. And um, people were spread all over the world. It was a very complex thing to hold together a liberation movement in exile uh, that had the success that ANC did over a period of 30 years. And that's where the huge leadership capacity and um, I would say sort of dignified intellectualism of, of Oliver Tumba came out um, and actually made the difference. Mm -hmm. So on the 74th anniversary of the ANC, uh, on the January 8th statement, when the message was usually sent underground in those days before digital technology, in cassettes and radio freedom and so on, the message would go out from the president uh, in his annual address since 1979 every year to make apartheid ungovernable. The urban insurrection of um, the late, uh, the mid uh, 80s, following the collapse of the tricameral constitutional model, uh, the ANC and its internal allies were riding on that and driving it and also giving direction in many ways. And Tambo said, make apartheid ungovernable. This is the year of MK. Mm. Um, literally, from there, he went and set up a secret committee of eight people which he called the Constitution Committee. And he said to them, um, the, the balance of forces is starting to move in our direction. And when the time comes, all wars end at the negotiating table. And when the time comes for talks, we must be ready and we must seize the initiative. That is exactly what happened uh, if one reads the book and uh, can look in hindsight. So... He said to them, "Start." they started with reading every, at that first meeting, every clause of the Freedom Charter and said, how do we translate this document into a constitutional document that's appropriate for that purpose? And within a few days, they had developed a document called the Skeleton, which was then sent um, to Tambo and the NSC, and uh, there was vigorous debate at the NEC level. 
Paolo Jordan was um, the administrative secretary of the NEC and chairperson of a subcommittee that had to um, deal with the to and fro between the committee and the NEC. And they, um, there was vigorous debate uh, amongst NEC members. The submission, the skeleton, caused a quite a buzz, I think, in Lusaka. And I um, have details, for instance, of conversations between uh, the chairperson, Jack Simons, and, and uh, Joe Slovo, saying it's not right at all to be talking constitution now. But that was the NEC's brief to the committee. And by the NEC then, after its own discussions of several months, sent guidelines on specific questions the committee had asked them and said, carry on to the Constitution Committee. That led to the Foundations of Government document. By October 8, 1986, mm. um, the ANC had then, in principle, the NEC discussing this document in length with its 18 at that stage um, um, paragraphs, um, said, and with Tambo's clear guidance that we are looking at a multi-party democracy where people's rights are protected on an individual basis mm -hmm. and with a, by a Bill of Rights. That was a radical move, actually, given the history of exile and the history of third world uh, sort of liberation movements and politics in the late 70s onwards. In chapter eight, you also speak about uh, Albi Sachs being one of the cadres who were involved, as you've just alluded, in translating now the principles of the Freedom Charter into being an operational constitutional document. Why was this important? Obviously, that was seen by the ANC as their guiding document that had a legitimacy of having been discussed in a society that didn't allow that um, in 1955 on a wide level and, and, you know, was accepted as a kind of a lodestar for the, for the movement. And that is the remarkable part about the politics then that you see. So, obviously, the concept of, of, of people's power, seizure of, of power, revolutionary struggle, the strategy and tactics documents of the 60s and 70s were very influenced by the notion of the armed insurrection and overthrow of the colonial state. And in, in this period now, the ANC feeling very strong and working closely with the internal uh, movements, the mass democratic movement, COSATU, the South African Council of Churches and sectoral groups, said um, almost reconnected with that tradition of the pre-exile period. Mm. Um, which had informed the ANC to, you know, to some extent from 1912, but particularly with the Africans' claim document of 1943, which was a step-by-step, -step, again, a clause-by-clause -clause response by 28 leading South African intellectuals and leaders that were appointed by Dr. Kuma to give um, the Africans' perspectives on what Churchill and Roosevelt saying we must never allow fascism and so on anymore, that we must be based on freedom and um, the rights for people. And that led to the formation of the UN and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, rights in 1949. Mm -hmm. And Kluma's committee and the young ANC of that time with the formation of the Youth League said that these rights that the global north as we know it today are saying must become basic must also be applied to their co co colonies and the colonial situation uh, of Britain. So you have then the move towards a much more um, an urban base for a national movement after World War II based in the cities and mass action and uh, direct action to and defiance to try and demand unequivocal um, equality and, and one person, one vote. So there's the return now with the struggle growing in the 1980s to the possibility now of politically putting into the agenda this discussion about what kind of future South Africa should be there. Um, this constitutional guidelines were accepted eventually 
in March 1988, after about 15 drafts, the constitutional guidelines were published in uh, August 1988. And the reason for the switchover was a brilliant, a few brilliant papers written by Paolo Jordan, the head of research of the ANC after Cubway. Oliver Tambo asked him to look at the constitutional plans that the ruling classes had in South Africa. And he said there were three uh, post the collapse of the tricameral model, <clears throat> because the regime was now bereft of ideas. And he said, from the liberal um, po politicians of the white establishment, who were really not liberal in the fullest sense, given their reluctance for full democracy, the business community, Anglo-American, the Verlichters, the Afrikaner, <clears throat> in, more enlightened people, but who still saw a change only being able to happen through the National Party and the government. Then there were the Urbelichters, who were the overexposed Afrikaners, so-called, who said you must look beyond the government for change now. And right through to the KwaZulu-Natal in Daba, uh, in which the homeland leader, in working with uh, the ruling class uh, politicians, uh, started uh, that idea. They were all based on group rights, Jordan said. Federalism, consociationalism, whatever you called it, it was group rights. Any constitution that would come out of them would be an us and them constitution. It would reproduce apartheid ideas of groups, of fixed groups, and it would also thwart the liberation movement ideals of of a South Africa that was totally free based on the will of the people. It would be a reproduction of the ruling class power in one form and another. So he said the answer to that is to actually go and say for individuals, every individual South African will be protected in this new democracy. And uh, in that way, it would be a radical way in which the uh, dispossessed would get what was then called majority rule and win their national sovereignty at the table. The other point was also that they all opposed the liberation movement. So when he said that the ANC must be very ready when the time came to uh, use all its different forms of struggle together with negotiations, but in a way that does not uh, let it be dragged into compromises like um, Lancaster House Agreement in Zimbabwe and Resolution 435, which kept talks on the table for more than 10 years through the United Nations. Um, and finally, he said the weakness of all these um, theories about a future model are that they see apartheid purely as the policy of the National Party and not a deep-seated structural uh, economic and political system of uh, built-in inequality and um, exclusion. And that obviously meant that any constitution in the future must be a transformative constitution. So one of the things that people say today, oh, it's not about rights only, it's, it's about uh, bread and freedom, it's about the land and it's about the economy. And that's exactly what the ANC people said, if you see the quotes in the book and the thinking, that it must be a bread and freedom constitution or else the ANC will find itself out in the cold as well. So it was a remarkable process and I document this step by step. I've almost came to the conclusion early on that you've got to carbon date the developments almost month by month from late 85 to February 1990 to overcome a lot of misconceptions and ignorance that still exists. So the point that I make here is that freedom was imagined, planned, was engineered and won by black South Africans. They weren't given their freedom. The thinking that underlay it um, was based on an intellectual tradition going back a hundred years to the people that I did my PhD on in the 1880s and 1890s and 1910s. They were the first people who articulated the vision of an inclusive South Africa, a democracy in which everyone 
um, would have to be incorporated. And obviously their politics were different and they changed generationally. The other point that I also, in looking back, think is important, and I'm trying to work towards uh, explaining this in clearer terms, is that Africanism, black consciousness and non-racialism, today we see them in fiery opposition to each other and people claim ownership of them. These three ideological perspectives have always worked in tandem with each other, sort of interlinked with each other over time. In certain situations, moving more this way and others more that way. So again, you see, for instance, the 70s with the black consciousness um, decade, the 80s that went to black consciousness. Today, Black Lives Matter is very, um, is very strong and vocal. And these are all from Sobokwe to Biko to, to Tambo. These are all universal in their thinking perspectives politically. From Subukwe seeing the human race as one to Biko's notion of black people standing up for themselves and freeing themselves, but within a broad international humanist kind of perspective, it wasn't like exclusion as the primary drafting thing. And non-racialism um, is the same thing. It's how, in, as an ant antithesis almost to the apartheid and colonial exclusion of people, to stress the inclusivity of our connectedness as human beings throughout the world. They also looked at the world from the 1860s when those early intellectuals were working out what does this mean now to be in the same colonial boundaries mm -hmm. and uh, in, the, in a common economy controlled by people from outside. What does this mean for us? And to do that, you have to look at the world. And already before 1900, so the internationalism of the ANC was very deep, and it was part of the reason for its political victory in the end. Um, by 1900, four of the first five ANC presidents, 12 years before its founding, had already traveled and studied overseas. And the whole thing of petitioning overseas, the studies in America, the Pan-African conferences and so on, and the solidarity networks of uh, anti-colonial and church movements that had supported people from the colonies. When the anti-apartheid movement was founded in the 60s, many of these um, foundations were already there in a sense. People had been operating for decades also on that level. And the international anti-apartheid movement was one of the two biggest single issue campaigns in the late 20, second half of the 20th century, next to the nuclear movement. By the time that Oliver Tambo called the Arusha conference in December, 1987, there were six, more than 650 delegates from governments, international organizations, solidarity groupings, and so on who attended. And he told them there about this change that we were busy uh, as South Africans working towards, and that when the time came, uh, the international, their international friends must uh, understand what was happening and support that drive um, when the negotiation started. And the remarkable thing was this was a three-stage process from 1986 to 1990. The first one was laying out the constitutional guidelines, the vision, the principles, and the values. The second one was to create the platform for this new kind of politics to take place. And that was where you had the more than 200 safaris, as they were called, of people going out of the country to meet with the ANC. In mid-1987, the National Party won 74% of the white vote in South Africa behind the theme of total onslaught and the communist onslaught by the terrorists on South Africa. The Dakar conference happened two months later in July and blew that notion of trying to isolate the terrorists from the people out of the water. It was massively reported and it was white South Africans going to speak to the ANC. But equally important, 
was the Arari Children's Conference on, on, on Children and Repression in South Africa. That, in a similar way, was the first huge, a big gathering of internal forces and the ANC in Lusaka, and two-thirds of the NEC went there, 20 people, and mingled with the South Africans in ways that had not happened before. And then there was the Arusha Conference, as I've mentioned, and then also the culture in another South Africa conference in Amsterdam, all following within a few months with the same purposes of creating a broad united front behind a vision of a united South Africa and no acceptance of apartheid in any way, and that the internal democratic forces must not be punished in the same way that sanctions have punished apartheid in the past because they were part of the forces for change. Mm. So this was a very, very well-worked-out political strategy. And it was within that context that only in 1988, for the first time significantly, to do the, uh, the uh, Goldfields talk start happening in, in London and Mandela speaking to um, Kobe Kutsia and his subcommittee in prison. This is not preceding the pressure and the strategizing. It is as a result of the pressure and the strategizing of the liberation movement that it starts, as I argue. Mm -hmm. And then the third phase is then the final push to back the regime into a corner it can't get out of. And that again is linked to these safari meetings in Lusaka, Harare, and elsewhere, where from 1986, the UDF, Kusatu, the ANC, and I, I always mention the South African Council of Churches, who were almost a social movement on the ground, protecting people, you know, creating a framework for discussion on an everyday basis about the, the, the politics that was happening. Um, would meet regularly and started actually strategizing for the first time together. In June 1989, they held a meeting where they said, we're going to bring out this new document called the Rari Declaration. In addition to the constitutional guidelines, this is going to give the conditions for the future, the, the preconditions for change and the framework for negotiations. This was an act of political genius that basically tied up the regime that, in a way that it couldn't get out of. So the, it's an old story, but it's the famous story of him going to each of the frontline states, speaking to the presidents. Nareri said, you can't do this and that. It would force that to happen. Every one of them gave their input. The ANC finalized that document. And at that moment, Oliver Tambo collapsed with a stroke. His doctors had warned him for three years already that um, he was uh, jeopardizing his health. But he said that this is his final uh, kind of um, political journey that he has to fulfill. And we then had the, the Sarari Declaration. And at the same time as that, on this, on, in June 1989, in Harare, the the MDM and the ANC met to plan the defiance campaign that started in September and the Conference for a Democratic Future that happened in December. There was Andre Odendal to discuss his book titled Dear Comrade President Oliver Tambo and the Foundations of South Africa's Constitution.